computer. So, um, now you're not going to work. Okay, let's see if this does. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, cheeky little title uh, for this. Uh, by the way, if anyone's in the Google Doc taking notes, there's also I'm going to put anything else related to this event uh, there as well. Any of our conversations or things that I curate as well, anything that might pull off the video afterwards. So, change. So, I I love these events. Uh, I went to Barcy's um, piece yesterday and was like, oh my god, there's so many cool resources, there's so much stuff. And she was building classrooms that have different structures in different places. And I remember when I did that in elementary, it was so fun. But how do you do all that? And how do you get permission to do that? And how do you not get in trouble? And how do you manage to do the other things that you're supposed to do? So, and then when you try to embrace something like uh, using, say, an online learning space, and you have to go through district protocols. And can you be a Google uh, education place or do you have to be Office 365? And can I use Moodle LMS or can I use Canvas because I can get a free Canvas account as a teacher. It's a really cool platform. It's really so all this stuff is out there. And you're going like, what do I do with this? Somehow you have to rationalize it back into your context, whether that be your teaching context or your school context or even the district context. And the, the issue is, is that therefore. How do I go about some of this change? And change as well for me in terms of my practices. So uh, what happened to me is that I landed a secondary school math science teacher and I landed in an elementary classroom. And not just an elementary classroom. The one at the lowest end of the spectrum in terms of socioeconomic. The one that the teacher before me that had this group before went on and became the Teacher, teacher for all of the kids in the district. So that is keep very well. Sorry about that noise. Um, that's the internet coming in and out here. Um, and so I couldn't line kids up in rows, but I had to figure out how to teach. I woke up one morning in October and didn't want to teach, didn't want to go to school. I was ready to go back to working in the supermarket because tomatoes don't talk back to you. Um, <laughs> And so I had to undergo change, and it was very deeply personal. Lots of tears, lots of frustration, but lots of people to help me. Um, so when we think about change in terms of what we're going to do, it has those processes. When we come to an event like this, we look at the successes. We see people say, I've done this, I've done this. So when we start to look at this, so people are learning, blended in online and building flexible learning structures. They're transitioning from online into doing support face to face, but also from face to face into online. They're personalizing. Those are constructive <coughs> buzzwords. Competency based is starting to talk about skills based. Okay, and we're not measuring outcomes, 125 million outcomes for students. We're measuring about can they do this? Can they be critical thinkers? Can they have 20% of skills? All of that stuff is, is all part of the whole thing. So we, we're describing a wonderful continuum between online um, and, and, and classroom. But to me, it's just blurred. It's just it's a blurred and it's contextual. So things that I can do in my classroom over here are not the same, so the same things I can do in my classroom over here. So it's all has to be put into context. But I get a little overwhelmed when I look at, and I look going across the country and seeing some of these things. Okay, what was that all about? <laughs> um, Across the country, the same thing started happening, and then I go and see some of the examples in the state, and then I see someone like Marcia come up and show videos of classrooms, and people like, that's fantastic what they're doing. I'm so intimidated. I'll never be able to do that by all people. So the, the question becomes one of, all we hear about is technology problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So, there we go. I'm going to stop using that. And walk over here. <laughs> and they're the old way. So technology has a few parts. Sorry about that. Can you read on that one? Or I'll sit down. Or one of the other. Okay. So technology is the factor, right? That's the X factor. I just get this technology, away it goes. Um, anyone use any other technology? No. 
So technology really is disruptive, but there are a lot of and they're not. In other words, you're a lot of I'm already a lot in technology because I don't have the latest version of. I don't know how to do this. Somebody shows me a new uh, app or a new uh, site or something. How can you use it? I don't know why. How can I not use it? I'm a lot of I'm, I'm used to what I'm doing. People ask me. I still have my tape back. I still have my church cable. You know. Um, but again, it's <laughs> it's not about the technology. It's really about the application technology. And yes, I have one of those. I have one of those. One of those. One of those. One of those. I've used all the technologies, but it so changes so much so rapidly. This is out of date. Okay, I just bought this. It's out of date. Great, good investment. So it's always about change, and I, I'm on a constant roller coaster. Is what we are. So I'm on a constant roller coaster. And so are you of all of this stuff, and it keeps coming, I, and I can't stop. I'm not addicted to technology. Why do I have to keep taking it? So it it, it goes back into that whole change thing. But I really like Poland's quote here: is that it's really if the focus can't be and isn't on technology, we all hear that. But the real change is what we do with our practices. So it's the application. And in, in my doctorate, I argued that, that technology is not the catalyst for change. It is a disruptor that causes us to reflect on our practice. If we allow it, many people don't. So it's the practice that's the key in terms of how we do that. So in moving forward then, how do we how do we do this, deal with this? Okay. Well, we can't because we don't have enough resources. And if the ministry would just give us some money to do, or if the district would just instead of that reallocate the money, to, or we're always looking for that silver bullet. We're always looking for that resource to come in, but it it really isn't. It's really about flipping the paradigm. It's really about flipping what we do in terms of our thinking, and really changing the narrative. So changing the story. So when I go to events like this, I look at all these gushy well bells and whistles and things that people are doing. When I really think about it and reflect on it, is that they've changed their thinking or their approach about what they're going to do in the different time. And they're using things in libraries to do that. But they're really fundamentally changing things. And when I work with some of the teachers in, in the online teacher training program, they hate it and they used to hate it when I was in school. It goes back to your philosophy. It goes back to your, your assumptions about learning. It goes back to the design and the, the thinking that you put forward in terms of how you're going to structure learning activities. So it really goes back to those, those fundamental precepts. And if we're not addressing or attacking or thinking about them, then I think we're not really getting to that pedagogical uh, commentary that, that Poland talks about. So that's, that's the easy to say. It's really difficult for us to go back and have that reflection personally, and then try and do it with your colleagues. And they're going to say, Mark, what are you doing over there? I mean, that's ridiculous. And you're going to say, well, and then you have to sort of try to invite them into the whole thinking, and they don't have time, i got to go to the hotel, right? <laughs> so it's, it's not an easy conversation to have in there, but it is the factor. Technology isn't the factor, you are. And it's, this is very meta-analysis research. It's old, but it doesn't change. When you're in the classroom, if you're in front of students, you are the factor. And we all know that because we've had really good experiences and really bad experiences on our own personally. But the challenge here is for you to change. So I, there's enough of us here to actually gather around one table. So let's do table talk that way because I really want I'm interested in what you have to say in this in this whole thing so how do you embrace change because for me it was personal and I was ready to walk away from making any changes it was easier it was easier just to give up walk away or stay trenched or to use the baby metaphor yeah, I don't change them. It's my own crap, I'm fine with it. So, what are your top three roadblocks? So, you want to do something, you want to make a change somewhere. What's typically, what's the first thing that gets in the way? What's this? Time? 
So when you say time, okay, well, let's, is anyone curating to do this? Do you want to on this? Yeah. yeah, if you don't mind, that would be awesome. Thank you for doing time. <laughs> oh, you're already in the dark? I think that was you, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what you Excellent. Okay, so oh, good. I appreciate I think, that. I think it's more has to do with your comfort. Like when you're comfortable with what you're doing and you want to attempt something else, it's easier just to do the routine stuff. This is the comfort. Yeah. I think sometimes the education has been around for a while. You, start to, you get frustrated because people are always pushing something new on you and you find it doesn't work. Or it doesn't work really well. Right, and then, done they, then they want you to do something that you know if you can become kind of skeptical of that's more enforced change and change that you want. But kind of talk that yeah. yeah. And, and, and that, well, that we tried that before and it didn't work where we tried it again or you know a variation of it. So I would have to the time. Honestly that's that's the moral thing that always happens. So I don't have time. To me, could we shift that and say, I don't make this a priority relative to everything else I'm doing? For me, it's not about a time within my. It's for me, it's about the time of I, I get these ideas and constantly reflecting on what's working, what's not working, how to make what's not working working. And I'm an early adapter in our school. I, I, I'm one of the early adapters of things. I'm also an early trasher. I'm like, oh, no, that's not Rub that out. You're on and off the bad radio constantly. Yeah, I don't, I get on and off because I have a very definitive idea of where I'm going and where I'm looking for. I think for the time factor is that I'll adapt something or I'll adopt into something and I realize how big it's going to be for me to really make it be that I want it to be. And, and that it's going to take a lot of my time. I mean, I've spent entire vacations building and redesigning, and, and then at the end of the day, I've lost my vacation. <laughs> the work day is starting back up, and somebody comes in and says, oh, we're going to do this. And I'm like, uh, no, because I've been working on this. So for me, the time thing is just trying, I'm going to change. It, it is happening, and I'm trying to figure out how to work that time back. I'm not getting rid of my personal time, my living time, in comparison to my work time. Okay, because I could work all the time. I don't want that. So okay. it's time. Okay. Anyone have a comment on time? I think sometimes I, I just, I'm going to go where we've been with we'll study board recently and we actually hit the point of too much change. Of like trying to change too much all at once, and it kind of slowed us down. And got a challenging, just a challenging year of trying to implement all the change that we wanted to do, and it was too much, which is hard for me because I'm like, like you like just jump in and just do it, just change everything. <laughs> um, so it's interesting discussion because we've just over the last month or so tried to build a process to do the right change, but we still we don't want to lose any ideas or any things that we want new. But then how then we narrow down so we're kind of committing to change one process at a time but but we're realizing we have to be really intentional about where we're at today to know why we're here it's to know i think it's i think it's a different way of saying saying the same thing that randy about the, the pedagogy or uh, pedagogy horse beating up the change horse is that if you know why you're doing what you're doing today it makes it easier to know if the change is right or which changes to prioritize next so we're just saying we now have this whole streamline of changes <laughs> that are coming, but then we look at all of them and we prioritize one at a time. And then once that becomes automatic, or we drop it or say it's not good, then we'll bring in the next one. So then for our software, for which courses we will, and our processes to do that as a company. So it's exciting. But you're grinding it back. Well, for us, it's always about pedagogy, but we know why the pedagogy is what we have right now and the kind of like learning we want to support, create, foster, and that kind of thing. But um, but then not then trying to change everything at once, but just going, okay, what's one more change to this? Should we change this to something else? Or like usually that's it's adding something new. What's something new that we could do? It's the right thing. But we just realize we only need we need to do one change at a time. 
versus changing your name. Yeah, there's probably an analogy for that. Stuff. I feel like saying, like when you were talking, is that when I make change, I want to trust that the outcome of my change is going to have an impact. That I want. Mm -hmm. So the amount of investment that I put into it will really matter if I know that in the end, the students who are on the receiving end of what I'm doing, that that makes a difference. Right? So I feel like for me, one of my roadblocks is trusting that this is truly the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of reflection on my part because sometimes you jump into something and you don't have any data to really support that this change is going to be better for that group of students you're working with, right? Like I don't have any results yet because I haven't tried this yet. But, but from what I know as a teacher and then what I understand about learning, I need that down, right? And, and then start evaluating that. But that's a big thing, thing for me is, is this the right thing? Is that time to evaluate it before I invest my energy? And then sometimes you just have to be a risk taker, right? But it, for me, it's risk and trust that this is right. I think one of the things that I find increasingly is, uh, I mean, I've been teaching online now for 10 years. Um, and I actually find myself going back to the practice, how I approached face-to-face -face learning in a conventional classroom, which I taught there for 11 years. And, and eventually my approach to that was actually to back off and give students freedom to, to pursue their own learning. And who am I to sit and tell you that you're going to learn best doing this thing? And so with all of this new technology, I can't keep up with it. There's stuff out there all the time. So I open, I now open it up to kids and say, bring the tech, bring your findings to me. If you find a great way to present work that works for you, go there, <laughs> find it, do it, show it to me. Instead of me trying to be the end all of it. And building this program, I, I kind of now am building just this structure that students can move quite loosely and, and around, and that I don't dictate to them how it's really going to look. They just have to come to me at the end with something for me to look at and assess where they're at and tell them what I think. So let me introduce another word that goes with risk and trust control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How would you agree, disagree, and at what level? Teachers are controllers. <laughs> <laughs> we were wired that way. As a matter of fact, we came and we were successful in the system of students because we had to have control. We followed the, the, the structure, and we were, what was it that uh, well said, we were successful at school. We were successful at learning. <laughs> and we were successful in social learning <laughs> But to give up control, oh my God. And that was my epiphany when I came from structured content control and went into an elementary classroom. And all I knew, all I knew in my gut was that this is wrong, <laughs> it's not a change. And for me, I'd try to make it out when we be stubborn and stick it through. And I got stubborn and stuck. But I had to give up everything. And I gave up control. I had to trust someone else as advice. Didn't ever see it that way. Never thought I and then uh, and I had to follow up. So I had to give up things. Take huge amounts of risk for me personally. So those were all very very difficult things to. And the system sometimes wants us to trust that this new data system is going to fix all your problems. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I mean, and so we get embittered about that, and that's why we hang on to things that work because the disruption to go try someone else's idea that we know has probably not been proven, probably isn't going to work here, and I can give up all that time and effort and energy to do that only to turn around and come back to the same spot that I was at before. So we, in education, we survive a lot of disruption. Not good. That's the other factor I think that comes in. Hi, right, you want to join it? No, just it, come pick up, pull a, pull a chair around. We're just we're talking about change. So, <laughs> okay, cool. It's just conversation. So, so time was one of the factors there. We've got to risk, trust, control. What else do we have? As big, broad.
roadblock to change? Fear. Yeah, that's a good one. How many more? Well, trying something new, jumping in is always a risk, right? And so your fear that you're going to fail, fear that the lessons can fall in space, whatever, right? You know, I'm just moving to new jobs, new places, new whatever. There's always that, right? And so that brings you to more fear. For me, it's fear of judgment. Gosh, it shouldn't be hard to do that. It's funny is that um, I've had real trouble giving anyone any of the lesson things or stuff that I produced because I didn't feel necessarily that they were worth it. So I, and, and Richard, maybe comment on this, but I know I've talked with the, the folks at W Western Canada Learning Network and others with Dirk and the Blue Hound and everything, uh, and you're involved in that conversation. People are kind of reluctant to give that up because all it takes is one person saying, um, you know that's wrong? <laughs> it's like, God, I'm out of here. It's very, very difficult. So fear is part of the trust, but it's the bad side of trust. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's Nathan. So tell us a little bit about you because we all introduce ourselves very well. <laughs> I'm actually with Study Forge, so I work Oh right, Nathan. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys so, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, but <laughs> overcoming experience. <laughs> But we know he doesn't trust. Because <laughs> you're, you're, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to talk about how to overcome all those things, the roadblock, because we would be here forever. But think back to some exactly changes we were involved in. How did you get past them? Why did it work? Why was it successful to change your business? Perseverance and excitement. <laughs> or enthusiasm, passion for whatever it was you're doing. Very cool. Belief. Yeah. The belief be part of that? Yeah. But that's what I was hearing you say. Right? It's that uh, really if you have to believe in it. Well, yeah, or 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 you know that there's a better way. And so you're willing to take that risk, right? Like you go, there's gotta be a better way. And I'm gonna um, and for me I look at like I, when I think about evaluating any change, it's always about, it's just, I have this vision of what school and learning could be, and I want to move that way, inspire other people to get there. <laughs> so I think it's just being excited about jumping in and trying to make it. Sometimes you're forced. We're doing this great new thing. We're going to teach all the other people. Okay, we've got to learn that. It was fun, but. Somebody triggered a learning management system. Exactly. Um, luckily, I was tech set. Still, sort of. So that was a big advantage, but it was like you need to learn how to use Power Teacher, how to use Google, how to use Blackboard, because we're still sort of using that. <laughs> it's like, it, was, uh, it was interesting and it forced you because there was no option. You know, keep your job, you got to do these things. And so, it's kind of like the sink or swim to game change. And so the success came, which was kind of like you have a choice. You continue, you do this, you know, kind of like jump in. So again, the perseverance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's <laughs> With or without enthusiasm. <laughs> Did enthusiasm come? Yeah, actually, I, I actually I quite enjoy it. And luckily, I was I just the platform I really was quite valuable. So I really enjoyed using that. Um, yeah, so I learned to kind of love it, maybe by force. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, sorry, like I've been doing this for ten years, and after ten years in a conventional classroom, I mean, it just came to me how why I became bored because I don't get bored of kids and their learning. That's not what I get bored of, but I get bored of the 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 course learning management system of the classroom, right? The classroom learning management system model. Bell rings. I only get 55, 60 minutes with you. We gotta get you in, we gotta sit you down and get you jazzed about what we're doing today. And I got and I got that into a routine where we do it quite efficiently and effectively, and I was bored in that system. Whereas after 10 years of online learning and teaching, I'm never bored. <laughs> there is always something new to be thinking about. 
about how I can make things better, how I can how it can transform. It's transformative. It's so there's it's never boring. Every year we came in, I came into huge disruption this year for us. We're having like a nervous fit since, since August when I discovered that my whole universe turned upside down. And but we're adapting to we're adapting to that change and you know trying to make it less disruptive so we can get back to what we were doing of the other change. So I think successful change that I've been involved in is it can be this this company definitely at first. But I seek change. I, I want things to change, but I don't like imposed change. I want to be able to discover my own change that I want to make. So I don't like institutionalizing imposed change. So but to a certain extent it's kind of the same thing that Mark is saying. Mark up again. You you were successful because but you what you said is that I don't want to push, I want to jump. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, but because you jump, you're making a conscious choice. So you have some level of trust that this is actually going to work. Yeah. So back to what Mark said. I try to take a little ownership over that. So I'm just trying to just plug it in and I engage with that. So I, I now push it back and try to encourage more change. So you did accept the environment as it was. You jumped in and said, let's start to make this work for me. Mm -hmm. And then by probably consequence, it's working for others better. Most of us. Mm -hmm. So so you've been so successful change was there was some level of trust, assurances. Um, you put yourself in an either or no choice, and you're just gonna jump in and do this kind of thing. And then but then you started to engage with the actual and started tweaking and you were involved and therefore became accepting of the change to the And I'm sorry, Andrea, like you, I would never go back to that structure. I still I look at eleven eleven uh, in the morning on a weekday and it's what it says. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's just like what? Why is it that we have to take a break now? Who said that it had to happen? Eleven eleven. Oh I know when I first started working in an online environment. And meeting with the teacher, like at the colleagues, said, Oh, well, let's have this meeting, let's have it at 10 o'clock or whatever, right? What's the time? And I remember thinking, What? You can have a meeting in the middle of the day <laughs> instead of at 3 30? <laughs> <laughs> or at 7 30? Yeah, exactly. And I remember thinking, Whoa, this is great. <laughs> how, how many of us are on like this? Right? So don't you just love the fact that, like, if you need to go in town at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I actually go and do that, and you actually come back and you're doing some work that way or whatever. But it's really a trade off. It's, well, it's, it's not, not like that. Well, I would say that when I first started that activity we experienced, there was a lot of flexibility. But now I'm finding that um, the district that I'm in is very consumed with this idea that we own you for your like 14, 15 minutes, and our minute counting begins here and ends here. And you better be there doing it at that moment. I was like, okay, I'll be there and do that. So they're trying to take out that flexibility, which here we're talking about giving more flexibility to students, but they still want to hang on tight to that. You can't work in Mexico, even if, even if you have an internet connection. There are old people in Mexico, they don't work. Did you, did you, yeah, did you go see Derek? Like, you, Derek? No. Oh yeah, yeah. I was here yesterday, yeah, and I yeah. saw yeah, like yeah, that concept of like, I would go to travel that he world. threw up for a whole year. He was teaching online, yeah. and traveling throughout the world. Yeah. I'm mean, well, like, how did you get away with that? Yeah, but the institution, <laughs> I know. the institution is very clunky. It but doesn't want to say every country to whatever it's saying. Yeah, no, but because he generated uh, a crap load of registrations and money and funding for the school district, so they put up those. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can do God. Not having right. international students participate, is that what he's No, he was actually out. But it, but it goes back to, it, to, to go out what he said in terms of you get, starting to get micromanaged. Mm -hmm. so, so why? Because they don't understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I remember because I worked it with a company that was virtual across Canada. Um, and in one of the, uh, I'm smiling because I don't know if you don't know exactly that time, but, uh, but one of the, the Concepts was that um, well, 
we don't know what they're doing working in their own home. So we're going to have fixed hours and they have to be online and accessible and if I need them, they better be there kind of thing. So now we're tracking hour. And I was like, why? <laughs> and so it became, I'm going to manage you because you're going to be sitting in the clock and I control that you're there. But I don't know if you're doing anything when you're there or you're not. Instead of looking at looking at the output and outcomes of what the individual does and give them the flexibility and the ability to make choices and decisions. And I saw the same thing in an office I in, which was that there's the same structure and control kind of things around what the individual did in each minute, as opposed to saying, what is it that they accomplished? And we don't care how and when they did that. So to me, it's always about, I don't understand what it is that you do, therefore I don't trust it. That you're actually doing it. Well, and my reaction to all of that has been fine. You say that I have, because I still work from home remotely, which is becoming a very contentious issue. Um, and there's like, you got to be doing it from this time to this time, filling your minute obligation. And instead of giving me the flexibility that I had earlier when I first started with Argyle, um, now I work those minutes. My computer goes off and I do not go back to work. Whereas before when I had flexibility, I could work for three hours and oh yeah, I need to run into town and get, you know, pick up a package at the post office and mail off some stuff to some students, go meet a student in the library on the way and stop at a bookstore and pick up a book that I really wanted. I don't want to start with that guy. Yeah, and then <laughs> and then I would I would get home in the evening and I'm like, oh you know, like I still have some things I need to get finished for, you know, so and so tomorrow. So I wouldn't Put in an hour here in the evening and get up in the middle of the night as an idea struck me how I wanted to do something. And I would my work became very flexible and I would be putting in my minutes, they just weren't conventionally designed minutes. And I was more keen to put in that time after hours because my hours were no longer this defined space. Whereas now it's like, no, okay, well, I will work from here to here, my computer goes off and I am done. I'm not answering the students' message at 10 o'clock. I'm when, not. When they need an answer. When they need an answer. When they're like, hey, yeah, yeah, we're going to your standards. So, so I have the same question, and I don't work in an online school, but I teach online for university, so it's a very different situation. Um, but I've always been curious about um, online schools and teachers that exist. And so I started drilling in, and I'm back to you, too, because I started drilling in Sarah. Sarah Okay, so Harry Scripton got a huge, I mean, I don't know what the are. Um, always been in a very good high school with students across all over the place. Um, and I was always puzzled, how do you keep teachers engaged? How do you know what you're doing? How do you measure success and completion and everything else in those situations? So I, any insights in terms of how that works? Because it, it's a model which is puzzling to most of us to come out of that control uh, structure. It was when I when I was teaching there. It was we were accountable for results, not for processes. So it's kind of like as long as your students were happy, then leave you alone. You're doing a good job. And then if things like if some of the metrics not, we're actually trying to do a better job, even on making people accountable for the results, uh, and then asking the process questions. So like they're they're working on they're working on always improving that, but that was always the kind of thinking behind it was however you get it done with your Especially kids. Yeah, are your kids finishing? Are they happy? Are they complaining? Are they getting the support that they need? If not, they let us know. <laughs> and so yeah, if you're creating feedback channels for that, then uh, yeah, I think I think and then I, I was thinking about that actually if we're talking about like, that's kind of what we're advocating in our education for our students. Is that figure out how to get there, yeah. take whatever pathway is going to work for you, <clears throat> um, but you're still accountable for your results. There's, I get concerned when it's like, oh, nobody, nobody's accountable for your results in education. You, the kind of self, self expression, expression isms that are like, hey, whatever you do is great and fine, and it's all great. I still think we need to then have good critical thinking about the outcomes. And then help people evaluate the processes and students evaluate the processes. But hopefully, it's looking at the time. 
I think, it, even just recently, like when I think of an online uh, student, the feedback that I get from is critical. That's important that, and sooner I can give it and uh, more precisely that I can give feedback for them to know what the next steps are is really important. So, because I'm interested in Facebook, so I need, you know, I do have to see my students face to face in different contexts, but that, that feedback piece is important. So, but even just recently, I, somebody said to me, well, you know, classroom teachers mark their student work after school hours. So it should not be unusual for you to have to do that in the evening. And I thought, no, actually, I do it all day long. Right? It's just like when I'm face to face with a child. And it was sort of that minutes of time. Like these minutes of time you're in front of the children. And if you, those minutes of time you go home and you, like in, in another day and age, take home a pile of student work and the kids do that. Right? So we think that you can do that in the evening. And I thought, it's a lack of understanding about how an online environment works and the engagement that we have with students. It's a fine and note model in a brick and mortar setting exactly. into a completely different learning environment. Yeah. So, so what can we do about that? Communicate. Communicate, but also, can. but also get the metrics on, get the outcomes, show the results, pull the students in terms of their ability to contact the teacher in the future and, and to have that. Just gather the data that shines the light on and then bring it forward. Uh, I watched a, a change happen in one of the school districts. Um, they wanted to go to that teacher at a distance and that kind of model. So, but it was in secondary program. So, the process that they followed for a full year, they got all the secondary administrators together. They uh, brought them in front of different people uh, to talk about what's in the online, the visiting schools that are online, and saw what was happening in the future, events like this, and conferences. And for a full year, that's what that secondary administrators and then they dropped them off because they understood what it was. They saw what was trying to be developed as well. And they knew then, therefore, how they needed to support teachers that were doing that, but also take away the load from that. So that to me is, is part of the whole process. So when we go back to there, how did he be able to actually create a cyber school and then go dancing around the world, still teaching in it? I think because he had full understanding of his district administration, exactly what he was doing, exactly how that worked, and exactly how they could get to that kind of population. Not the easy to say, really easy to say. How do you do that? Again, everyone's context is going to be different. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah, maybe the answer is to say, like, Talk, talking about two different things, we're talking about if you have a supportive administration, not so supportive administration, how what they're measuring. Uh, I think if you can prove, I think proving the model is again that. But if you're the one trying to drive the change, then if you can say, ah, I don't have anything to shred, not that I agree or love everything about this book, but Tim Ferriss is the four hour work week. And he talks about a whole process that he went through to get his boss to agree to him telling you, as he showed, look, if I can. If I can actually do 20% more than what you're expecting, and I can do it from home, how can I do that? So he, he, he showed that he could actually do better work if his boss took off any of the restrictions. So um, knowing what's, what the important metrics are, and defining those for your school is important too. Like, do you care about activation rates? Do you care about completion rates? Do you care about student performance and grades? What are those metrics? What are they? And then the change should improve those theoretically. Or engagement. I mean, there's all kinds of different different metrics. I mean, not it's not necessarily grades, and there's all you have to explain all that data. Because oftentimes in online, you get online data compared to campus data is very, very, very different because you're often getting the people that aren't being successful on campus to be online. And so you have to explain all that. But if you can, then you can show like, hey, what if we could do this better? I, don't know. I mean, it's interesting. Like, up, I I so have. I had so many discussions though about change and, and and I had more discussions about the collective agreement and it, it seemed to be this collective agreement that was holding back the change I wanted to put forward. Like these ideas, like if I show you that you're just as successful the students doing this, this, and this and having these parameters to off and giving us this freedom of 
flexibility of how we do this. And then it became an argument of you're not obeying the collective agreement, you're not following it. So it's like, well, then my the ATA has to start understanding how this is all changing, right? Like that we're negotiating minutes where, I mean, we aren't negotiating minutes of learning with kids anymore. Why are we negotiating minutes of, of work with teaching? With our tasks, and so you get an administrator who sort of, you know, isn't. They're like they are more concerned about let's do what works rather than let's see what that collective agreement says we can do. Or you get a person who's really attached to that collective agreement and supervises and making sure that that is implemented to the T. Everything, and that changes how a building works. It changes how the organization is structured, and the change that goes away goes in the long term. Similar conversations, uh, in BC, uh, even a decade ago, when the Teachers Federation wanted to study and figure out because it was so off the map and no one understood what was going on. It was just slack, and it was still there, and then teachers coming out of the class and putting all that energy and effort into their practice uh, would arrive, and then they go, like, Oh, you mean I can't tell, you can't tell, you can't tell, you can't tell, they're gone. And they're going, like, It's not that easy. I don't get to sit in the desk and drink coffee and just, you know, add an email here and there, Mark. But then it's very fun to work on. I think that was the paradigm that they lived in. Um, so, so they, the teachers' federation, the collective agreement is very similar. They're kind of my hours, my condition. And the concern is always is that, that you know the schools are taking advantage or is taking advantage of the teachers, and they're not they have too many kids, and they don't have they don't have a crap or a break, and it's constantly kids are there, and we're having to be harassed at night, and it's like they can't get out of this trap. So what they did was they created a focus group and they brought online teachers together. And part of that was part of the whole data collection. Guess what? It was changed the whole agreement. I wish they may, I think that's small. But um, it's because the teachers basically said, we have flexibility. We're not being abused. Yes, sometimes sometimes I get to use it more longer. It's because that's the way it was the funding model is driving this kind of thing. But typically at the end it balances out. So, so, so bringing the voices together, bringing people's attention to understand the practices, but most importantly, breaking breaking the paradigm. So it's it's we talk about it's shifting culture. So there's a culture of uh, of uh, conformity that exists in education, and it has stood the test of time. It's it's a, <laughs> so so I mean scorefront all tests were were it's like ah pass off no one cared you do whatever you wanted you know let's say you start doing kitchens and cooking and you start to see kids wandering around and they get you know and then this conversation is like this isn't a school this is just a hangout for juvenile delinquents you know and how come you're dressed like that why don't you have a tattoo teacher I mean, you're, you know, so I know more piercings than the king. You know, <laughs> and, and but what it is, it's a litigation that the tradition was not. But it doesn't fit the Darwin conform structure that we're we're, we're trapped in. And, and but that culture of conformity is from another time, right? It served a time. It served a purpose in another time, in an industrial time. Like you wanted to have factory workers who knew all the steps they had to do. That isn't the that isn't the moving forward. Like though our students are not going to work in a culture of conformity. That's not going to be their life. The change that you talked about, that when we buy a new device and new software, it's already out of date because we don't need something new, is going to be their reality of the students we work with. And education needs to be that. It needs to compare them to it. needs to be needs to be needs to be. I I'm because great. The question is how do you show people? How do you? But that, because but it's really good to identify that these then not everywhere. I think there is a shift happening. That 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 cultural conformity, like to me, that just and I, that's what we all face it. It's what we see, right? So and we see little cracks in it, but like a collective agreement that was built for another time, it, it, it that doesn't work anymore. Or the school district's way of organizing their resources that doesn't work anymore. Like it's interesting to see even in Edmonton. And I, I haven't had a lot of opportunity, but to see some of the new schools and how they design, right? They don't, 
Um, so they don't have these walls like this. They have a grand store that we can go through all because it depends on what the students are doing. So there, people are beginning to see that little bit of understanding that we need to not only have a difference in how we teach, but also that our environment that we work in has to right? The physical spaces. And I think to go back to in terms of shifting culture is the, the, the key is, is to focus on what curriculum, what 21st century, what we're trying to do with students is to build that kind of a, a, a situation. And then to simply put that argument back. But, but also to expose a lot more in terms of what our practice is, where the successes are, and, and how they teach people. Uh, I think that's the only the only thing that we do. But it's, it's kind of like, I think to a certain extent, when I look at the, the whole educated K-12 system in terms of if you're outside of it, so I mean, I, I've seen, I follow some of the others that tried to make change with it, and they just they came and did the school, and they just did what they needed to do in the independent school because they're outside of the structures which can constrain that. Uh, in, in online, in some cases, uh, is running under radar still in different locations. It just, just continues to do that. Uh, to beg forgiveness. You know, just go and try and do things, uh, but then track. Uh, legitimately and, and track the data in terms of the successes to, so you can defend what it is that you're doing. It's just not some lingering idea that's going out there. But the, the, the culture of conformity is to me is kind of like when you get the fish out on the back in the back end of the, the, the boat, just let it flop. It, it'll go on its own, but you put another flop, that's reactive. So I think there's an overabundance of, of uh, reaction. To a certain extent, because to go back to the words around change, there's a fear, there's a risk, there's a lack of control that happens within that. And do I really trust? Because I really don't know. I can't trust the one I know. So the people that have that those those uh, positions need to be um, better informed. Coming back to the secondary administrators, a whole year before any change was put into the situation, so they could. Right. They could converse. They could tweak it and you know add different components to it so that there is some level of control. Because honestly, I don't feel the sense of control in my opinion. Uh -huh. I'm definitely a I am definitely control. Just ask my wife. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the 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 that's Technological skills are certainly important, but it really focuses on pedagogy. That's that's one that step. So I think that that those are really important pieces. And I don't know about you, but I I got a lot. But in terms of simple understandings, the question is now how do I apply? How do I take this and how do I go back in this situation? So I'm going to ask you that question. You can embrace change yourself. How are you going to apply some of these things? In your own situation. So think about one thing, and I always like to do that and, and be the best. Is it okay? You're away from all the chaos, everything else is what some of you have it's still here. Um, but um, how are you going to take some of these notions, some of these ideas from this event and apply them? Take a couple of minutes just to think about that, think about our conversation. Think about what you might want to do or can do. Just do that one little thing here. Right. Maybe write it down. Mm -hmm. 
Now I'm trying to go back to your idea on control. Can I surrender? What, what could I give up? It's like, are that up? I give up a lot of control. I because I don't like being micromanaged myself. I can't stand it. And so I believe by the whole control of you much better since you have to look to you. I do not like to be micromanaged. And I so I try not to, and actually I think I'm quite good at not liking the control of the study. Um, I don't put due date something saying this is the date you have to have things done. It's not done and closing it. Boom, you have to move on because time's up. Yes, but we have to get through this. It's like, you know what? You're on your journey and I'm on my journey. I'm here to help you if you need some help. I'm I'm more of your learning strategist. I'm your coach. I'm your so if you come and have conversations with me about where you're at, if you need to be slow, if this is going to take you three semesters to complete this course, I'm okay with that. I'm not going to try and rush you through this. And my mantra is it's all about the learning. That's what it's all about. I mean, I'm not here to it's about learning. And if you're learning, then everything else is kind of gravy, um, or it will be gravy at some point. So uh, students get hung up on marks. I'm like, I really like to, I'm not hung up on your mark. Like, I'm looking at where you're at, and I can tell you right now, you're satisfactory. If you don't want to be satisfactory, and you want to go somewhere else, come talk to me. We'll, I'll give you some strategies on how to get there. So I don't have due dates. I have suggested pacing guides. I suggest if you want to break the exam in January, but you have this piece of time, but who knows? You could sit down and do these things in the Air Force. There's a lot in it. You need to read, you need to write, you need to do these things. But ultimately, I don't want to manage and learn. And I don't, and I don't even tell them what they have to do to assignments. They can pick and choose what they want to do. And I had one student who would use the rest of me and I don't do all these assignments and I just do my own thing and then I write the assessment piece or I bring their assessment to them. I'm like, no, I'm not going to judge you. Like, how many of my assignments you did. But when you come in to show me and to demonstrate to you what you learned, it needs to be a very complete picture. It cannot be, you know, a fluff ball on the field box. So they could talk about, oh, yeah, this represents nationalism. Like, well, how? <laughs> I need to know more. So so it's I give them all this freedom. And yeah, giving that control is hard because we're then told, well, how are you measuring this test? It's like, it's your conversation, actually. And if they're not having conversations with me, if I, and they're not doing anything, they're not progressing. So then the question is, how do I get them doing something? And it's usually a match. Yeah, I take off all the back It's interesting to me, and I ran against this in a couple of different secondaries, um, in that um, I believe in the constructivist and you know, sort of approach, and so I'm teaching you uh, a course on educational accountability and change in post-secondary institutional environments. And and so off, off I go by saying, well, they're the experts, let's co-create the content, I'll facilitate the, the discussion, the guide, and off we go. So, and still had only the outcomes that were there as part of the whole course. So I said, okay, so this is it. So now the person putting that up over there in the loop. They were like, that's not a course. These people pay money. They expect to see blah, 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 blah. So I have to go, well, what? So, so what I had to do was put all that crap together, figure it out, you know, and now I'm going to get challenged on it because I don't know. Anyway, I put it together and then I then invited a conversation to do what it was in terms of co-creating in context and really focus on the project. So, but the accountability to the institution were there, the rationality was there, the conformity to Culture was there, and I very for it. And so, to me, the beauty of the online environment is that you can produce that, and then it's there. And then the student that goes, "I need structure." It's there. That's what works for you. Off you go. Now I can vary, from it, and I can be creative, and I can break the sort of the the, the 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 structures down. I can be more inventive. I can be more responsive and more engaging with students. But unless I got that there. And to me, as a teacher, when I first started, all I could do was that conformity. But as soon as I had that together, I was like, oh, I don't have to screw around with this. And that's where you engage a professional. So to me, in looking at, okay, let's do something, uh, it's not about breaking the chain of conformity. I think that you just chip away at it and continue to chip away at it. 
But I think if you can take something, and do one idea, one notion, and do it within the context of where you currently are, all of a sudden the LMS is not going to be necessarily the only place where you're going to be first. You have to start it there. But as soon as you are able to vary out of that, and to me the LMS is that structure that just forces that part. But at the same time, all of your schools are audited. There's accountability back to whoever in your element provides that. So that's your conformity today. Get out of it as fast as you can, but still feed that piece where it has to be. But me, that's kind of where. And I need that piece low maintenance because I give them all the answers after they finish. Yeah. It's a self check thing. If it's a basic comprehension stuff, it's a self check. If it's multiple choice, I never give them answers because I want them to keep it out. Each of you here are the leaders for change in their own area. So go for it. Lead. So thanks for your, your time. Hopefully there's something out of it. The, the whole rest of the slide deck is there to some of you can change your as part of that. Or just engage me and we'll go further if you're looking for something else that's not beyond that. But thanks for the conversation. Thank you. It's really interesting. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit like this was like victims of the burden. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is, but still, there's there's some challenging notions in there. And then when I look at this, and I, I think to myself, I guess I go back and reflect on oh, okay. my own work. Oh, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. And I think that sometimes when you land here, like you already are kind of up for change, mm -hmm. it's not about not wanting to. I think it's more looking around to see who else is with you in the life boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and also understand 